Okay, so I just want to explain real quick before we continue that um, this is really our way of helping to center the voices of young people. And this was a group of young activists who participated in a um, program that we will also hear about during this conference. So if you haven't signed up for it, you can definitely listen to the um, recording after the conference and then learn if there's anything more. But I am going to say, um, we're just going to switch around here a little bit. Um, I want to say I am delighted that Deborah DiBetta was able to join us. Um, welcome, Deborah. I just want to introduce you real quick before we jump in and you can tell us how we can support these young, wonderful people that we just heard who are full of hope and um, energy, as well as a drive to really change the world. And I think this is what we hopefully can support in their, you know, um, their ability to be resilient and creating environments that are conducive to that. So Deborah DiBetta is a certified mindfulness instructor who has taught mindfulness programs throughout Long Island for teachers, students, administrators, and parents. She's formally trained and qualified, uh, a qualified teacher of mindfulness-based stress reduction. Um, she studied at the University of Massachusetts Medical School Center for Mindfulness under John Kabat-Zinn and in mind-body medicine. And Deborah is also a certified mindful school instructor and her extensive education includes an MA in physical and um, health education. She has a BA in psychology and special education, elementary education, and two hours of registered yoga teaching. And she's a Reiki level two practitioner. She created, um, and she created and currently teaches a year long mindfulness and yoga program at Limbrook High School. So welcome Deborah. I don't know if you are able to share your screen. If not, I will go and grab your presentation from my email. Um, just, you're here. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of technical difficulties here at Limbrook High School today. Is everyone able to hear me clearly? Okay, wonderful. I'm using my cell phone because our um, technology is actually down. So I'm using my own Wi-Fi and I usually have my headphones for my phone, but I don't have that available right now. So um, thank you for your patience. And yes, Julia, I'm gonna need your assistance with using um, the PowerPoint. Um, that'd be great. Um, so while you do that, um, thank you for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here and, and to share the importance of trauma and awareness and mindfulness and its role in education and how we can support students. And it's, I think it's a really integral part of, um, of the educational system, not even just for students, um, for teachers as well, educators or social workers or guidance counselors. And I'll explain a little bit more about that. But what I'm going to do is, as we're getting ready to go through the PowerPoint, um, many of you I don't um, may be coming off of lunch or from another conference, or from another um, workshop. We're going to do a little bit of a grounding exercise. You know, we can talk and do chalk talk, talk all day about um, what these practices are, but let's check in with ourselves. The most important, and see how we are doing and giving us some time to decompress. And also um, this introduction practice, it's a practice of inter interoception. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in my presentation. It's paying attention to ourselves and our bodies and, and, and taking time to see, hey, what is going on? And what does the skill or just bringing awareness, what does awareness do? to our bodies just by simple act of paying attention. Now, as we go through this practice, there's no goals here. We're not trying to calm down. We're not trying to get anywhere. We're just checking in. So let go of any goals or um, what this should look like. It could look like every anything. So I'm gonna invite everybody just to, um, yeah, put down 
pencils or pens, phones, really give this as an act of generosity to one check in. So settling in and just coming into the body, coming into this moment, giving yourself permission to sort of just sit and be, not even to analyze what I'm saying, but to truly just to meet yourself where you are, whatever you may be holding. Maybe at this time of the day, there could be some fatigue or tiredness. Maybe there's some excitement, hopefulness, all this wonderful information you've been receiving today. But whatever's here, just allow. And begin by just bringing your awareness to the connections of the body Touching, grounding, or settling, whether it's your feet on the floor, your seat in the chair, your back feeling supported, just bringing awareness to places where your body is connected or points of connection. And see if it's possible to just give yourself to permission to settle in land and sense into these touch points of the body. And see if it's possible to bring your awareness. Can you even sense into the force of gravity that is supporting this body? And if it's possible to invite the system to relax just 1% more, and it may or it may not, again, no forcing, just an invitation. So see if you can just settle in be held, supported by the force of gravity, letting go. And begin by bringing your awareness now up to the top or the crown of your head and just sensing into the length of the body. We were just at the feet, now coming up toward the top of the head and moving down toward the forehead into the cheeks and the eyes bringing your awareness to the tip of the nose, possibly even sensing into air entering and leaving the nose. Moving your awareness down toward the mouth and the jaw and the teeth. Notice if there's any clenching and can you invite a 1%, a little more ease into the mouth area. And then moving your awareness around toward the ears. And just opening up to any sounds that are here in the environment. You may hear sounds that are really close, sounds of your own body. your own breath, sounds within the room, maybe that you sharing the space with other people. Some sounds may be natural, some sounds may be synthetic, but just different textures, vibrations, tempos, volumes of sound. So we're just resourcing what is here. Moving your awareness now down toward the throat and the shoulders, moving down toward the arms, the biceps, the triceps, the elbows, the forearms, the hands, the fingers. And then moving down back up toward the throat and then down toward the chest and the heart, sensing into the heartbeat. Moving down toward the belly, possibly there's sensations of fullness if you've just eaten lunch or maybe hunger, if that hasn't happened yet. And see if it's possible to sense into any subtle movement within the diaphragm or the lower belly of the breath. 
expanding and contraction, contracting as it moves in and out of the body. Shifting the awareness down toward the pelvis and back down toward the seat. Again, sensing in to the force of gravity being held, inviting your body to even relax and let go just a little bit more. Gently moving your awareness down toward the thighs, the quadriceps, the hamstrings, the knees, the shins, the calves, the ankles, the top of the feet, sensing even to the sneakers or shoes or socks around the foot, the toes, and then sensing into the earth below, possibly even just gently pushing into the earth, sensing into the here and now, And then taking that sense of here and now and the support and bringing that back up toward the back up into the body, traveling back up through the legs, the knees, the seat. And now coming to the spine and just tracing the, the spine from the sits bones all the way up to the top of the head and sensing into the length of the body from behind. And inviting now this attention or awareness that we're working with and see if it's possible to find your breath or connect with the life force, either at the tip of the nose or possibly it may be most vivid for you at the belly or connecting with the breath and just the gentle movement of the shoulders with the inhale and the exhale, the rising and the falling. So whatever it is easiest to connect with the breath, just, just acknowledging this life force, this breath that also directly impacts this nervous system that we have. Many times we think of our bodies or the health of the bodies. We think of a body being fit and strong thin or fat, we also have this nervous system within us. And the breath is literally the gear shifts of this nervous system. Inhaling gives us energy, vitality, sympathetic arousal as the exhale actually brings us into this rest and digest and this relaxation response. So see if it's possible to extend your exhale longer than the inhale, just to come into parasympathetic, come into a rest and digest, soothing and cooling the system, letting go of anything that does not serve, allowing that exhale to just I like to say, I think of an ocean tide. I live out on, on the water here in Long Island and the exhale can be a cleansing breath, a letting go. So just listening to the sound of my bell as we end our practice, and just allow your attention to just listen to the bells. I will ring it three times to just bring our awareness back.
way. Just taking a moment here. Good to see everybody. I'm on a phone, so I can't see everybody's faces, but I'm scrolling through and I see a lot of names, a few faces. And I just wanna possibly just ask the participants if anybody would be generous enough and throw your voice in. You know, how was that practice for you? What did you notice by just bringing awareness to ourselves in a generous way? Anyone just would want to just unmute? You don't even need to raise your hand because I can't see anybody. If anybody feels inclined. At this point of the day, it felt really good. And I like that you used the um, phrase inviting the intention attention because I haven't used that with students. And I feel like sometimes students react as saying, well, but I can't relax and I can't, you know, so I really liked that idea. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, Trish, for that. Yeah, that is a big, big word. Your wording is everything when it comes to the system. A word can either create resistance or it can actually open up opportunity. So the invitation, exactly, because some people don't, but it's like, oh, I can go there though if I change my mind or if my system starts to cool. So yeah, thank you so much. So languaging is huge when it comes to meditation. And another thing I did not do, I just want to check myself, which I always do. I think there was just so much going on over here for me. And I, when I work with adults, sometimes I go a little bit more into um, direct settling. There is a resourcing part component that I didn't do in the beginning, which is, you can start also by, before coming inward, you go outward, okay? So just checking in, looking around the space that you're in, colors in the room, finding three colors, finding three shapes. See if you can now tune into poison very casual way. So, all right, hold on. I'm just going to, Julia, I'm going to try to send you this, um, my um, PowerPoint again. It could have been because our system is down. Let me try it one more time. So I'm sorry, I apologize everyone for the pause. Okay. And I appreciate everybody's patience today. our whole entire system. So me and Julia were laughing today. We're like talking about having to be resilient and talking about embodied resilience. Uh, um, Cause things happen right in life and teaching and, and, um, and sometimes unexpected and real important. So as I'm working here, um, Many times when a stressor, right? Not having enough resources, that is stress. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more, more trauma, what trauma is, but how can we maintain balance in our nervous system? So everybody has a stress response and a stress response is a physical reaction within the body, muscle tension, tightness, um, agitation, uh, sweat, heartbeat, so the interoceptive awareness practice, which we did is checking in and what happens when just our own kind of tension comes in. Okay, I'm multitasking right now and I'm not very good at multitasking. So one more second, Julia, I apologize. 
Okay, thank you. That's quite okay. I think we can give you a moment to just, you know, do what you have to do so that you can send the information. And in the meantime, you know, we can take our own breaths and regulate and um, yes. And if I think I figured it out now, let's see. Okay. We have a cloud here, a system. So I think the PowerPoint that was sent to you Okay. Yes. Was was through the cloud. So let's try this again. Yeah. And my cloud doesn't want to talk to your cloud. <laughs> so, yes. We'll see. Let's see how that. Let's see if that went through. Okay. So I'll. Yeah. I'll begin. A little bit more. So real quick, anybody else want to talk about that practice? So yeah, the word inviting. So languaging and mindfulness and stress is everything. Because we never want to make anybody feel that there's a right way or a wrong way. Because there's no right or wrong way to being human. You know, and if there's a wrong way or you're doing it wrong, that's just going to create resistance and stress. When a system has a lot of energy that needs to be charged and we don't give or allow different pathways or, oh, there's only one way to do it. That's you know, that there's only one path. So the invitation and you know, it, again, it's, it's, it's putting up pathway for the discharge to happen. Anybody else would like to throw their voice in? I, hi, this has been too. Um, I liked how you talked about, you know, when we think about health, we think about the body, right? Like eating, drinking, but the health of our nervous system. And you know, I, I, I thought, oh my gosh, this is simple. Just a breath takes care of the health of the, you know, once you say nervous system, usually it gets complicated. We're thinking meds or whatever, but to think that something as simple as breath can be, nourishing to that system was uh, yeah I held on to that thought yeah and you know so a little bit about I have intensive studies in mindfulness and then I moved into I'm actually currently in my care of somatic experiencing which is trauma resolution work and there's so much information and I don't know if even porges in the polyvagal system nervous system and the and the discharge and everything so overwhelming. And it's like, and my goal today is simplify and to look at it as in the lens, what trauma is or chronic stress is, is a dysregulated nervous system. Simple as that to simplify it, even though there's a lot of more complex and a lot of, I want to call it psychobabble around it, but it's a whacked out nervous system for street terms. And the reason why I'm talking how I talk to my students, so if you think about that, all right, not that I am anxious, it's okay, there's a rumbling within the nervous system because there's a little bit of dysregulation. How can I, how can I shift down in order to, to self-soothe myself? So you are not anxiety. Oh, the anxiety is here. Now my nervous system is a little whack. And I'll talk more about that if my PowerPoint comes up. Um, Julia, how's that looking? No? I, no, it's not coming through. Try one more time. All right, I'm going to take one more pause. And I saw that relaxing. I'm glad this was relaxing. It is to take a breath. You know, it's a very simple concept. John Cabot's mindfulness practice, right? the art of being present, the art of breathing. We just got to remember how to remember when, to do it, right? Many times is threatened, ease up the breath because, you know, the system seizes because we're in that sympathetic charge or that sympathetic arousal, whether it's a cute to-do list of the day is, you know, it is long or if it's big traumatic stress, so the gear shift down the nervous system is the breath, specifically the exhale. So there's coherent breathing, which I will also do today with you. Um, there's a um, 
so many, there's so many different breath works um, models to use that um, help to discharge the energy. And I'll hopefully I'll go through some of those today. All right, Julia, here we go. One more time. And there's um, one question in the chat, Deborah. Yeah. Um, the, it's so. Uh, the, is there any modifying version to accommodate for mask wearing in schools? You know, no. The, you know, the, at first the kids were like, oh, you know, last year was hard, and it was hard for me. So I had to sort of. Um, it was a challenge for myself as well, but no. The only thing that I will do is, you know, um, talk about when we're fine. Can you sense, can you sense into the mask on your skin? Mm -hmm. The temperature of your breath under the mask. So you're going to neutralize it. What is that like? You know, can you bring curiosity and not, oh, this is bad. This is good. What is it like to breathe with the mask on your face? In a so by Bringing, curi being, bringing curiosity um, and this inquiry of what is here, it neutralizes, you know, those labels that we and we said, oh, I like this or I don't like this because then the kids will shut down. So with mask wearing, um, bring a sense of inquiry and curiosity, but everything else, it's been, it's been okay. Okay, hold on, Julia. I'm going to try to save it to my desktop right now. Yeah, if we were all in a room together, I would say, let's pull up a chair and have a conversation, <laughs> you uh, know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I do that. Let me try one more time. And if not, I'm not going to try any more and I will continue. But as you're sitting here, you know, again, just breathing. And, and, and the conscious breath, breathing with awareness. And then again, the manipulating of seeing if you can use the exhale longer than the inhale. Also the point of, of just observing the breath. Each breath, this is a really cool little piece of information. Each breath is unique and individual, like a snowflake. There'll never be a breath like another breath. So I, again, that curiosity, this inhale, like what's this exhale like? And it helps also to focus. Okay, let me just send this email, Julia. I had to come out of the cloud. This is why it's so long. And again, our whole school, we're having tons of technical problems right now. Yeah, there was a storm somewhere or is a storm somewhere that is interrupting our communication. Oh, yeah. Okay, let's try this and hopefully this will go. It won't go. Okay, let's see, Julia. So I'll continue talking as we pull it up, just as if we didn't have it. So a little bit about what trauma is. So trauma, it's overwhelm of the nervous system to be able to discharge these states. So I have a little diagram here that you have, we have this, we have this rhythm parasympathetic, sympathetic, parasympathetic, sympathetic. So all day long, depending upon what's happening in our life, we're even in rest or digest. We have this normal range because we do need um, a bit of activation in our lives. If not, we wouldn't get things done, right? Everybody will be laying in bed watching Netflix all day. We need to pay bills. There has to be a little bit of, of charge in the system. 
Um, not there wouldn't be. So what happens in trauma is that when there is then the system gets stuck. There's never a discharge. So the example I want to use, if you ever watched the Discovery Channel, and if you ever saw an animal who was about to be attacked. So you have an animal in the wilderness grazing, right? Get an antelope far. And as the antelope is grazing, they hear rustling in, in, out in the grass. Antelope freezes and then comes up and looks around and surveys and sourcing to see like, am I gonna have to get out of here or not? Oh, we're here. All right. Okay. Is this where you went? Yes, yes. The resilience this zone. This is where we were. So the at so what happens is the um this was the discharge. So um this is what happens when the system is stuck and the, and it's not discharged. So back to, I'm sorry, back to the uh, So say the antelope gets chased, the tiger comes, they run around like crazy. And if you ever see saw those videos, I wanted to bring one today, but I, it was, it got deleted off of YouTube that once the animal is taken down, it plays dead. And the tiger either goes and then the antelope gets all of a sudden it's alive again and it runs away and it starts shaking itself off. That is the discharge. Animals can naturally shake it off. In adults, we get stuck. And or humans. I don't want to see adults. It happens to children, too. OK, so let's go on to the next slide. So trauma interrupt, interrupts our health and it is not an event. It is actually in the nervous system. So Julia, you can hit the next slide. And what happens is with this, it interrupts this whole health of the system from our brains to our bodies, to our immune system. In California, Dr. Nadine Burke, we're gonna watch a little video. I don't know if we'll have time yet. And she in California, she is a pediatrician, um, phenomenal. She looked um, she decided to do um, a trauma inventory. It's mandatory in the California school system because they're seeing students who are impacted with trauma and are not treated is, is something that long can impact their long-term health and well-being. Okay. So next slide. So events that disrupt the nervous system. So if you look, the bottom events, accidents, falls, medical procedure, loss, illness, it's what happens can be a result from an ordinary day. Or if you look up on the top, sometimes it can be long-term and chronic. But these are some of the events that can disrupt the, um, the system. So the next slide. And some of the basic uh, impacts of the trauma that impact with a student can become withdrawn, a loss of confidence, develop irritability, depression, anxiety, phobias, and then aggression, hyper, hyperactivity, and addiction. And what's really interesting I find is many students, I'm not gonna say all, but many of the students we might find in special education settings. And it could not, the learning disability can come from a, you know, an adverse childhood experience, which is the ACEs scale. Those are all the ones I talked. It's like, it shouldn't be the question, what's wrong with you? The question should be, what happened to you? And this is what we're missing in the paradigm of education, or hopefully we're moving into it. So re it's really interesting because I have a special education degree and we learned behavior modification, right? Change the child's behavior, change the structure of the school setting so the students can um, be successful. But the problem is we can change the behavior, but we're not healing the child. We're just fixing, we're putting a Band-Aid on it. And that's why sometimes it can be a lifelong struggle. So um, I don't know if you wanna 
Um, Julia, if we have time, it's about a three minute video, but I'll leave it there. The PowerPoint can be sent out and shared with everybody as well. You can access the video um, and that's like a little three minute clip. Okay. So the brain on trauma. So it's very interesting because for mindfulness and meditation, the same areas are impacted as it is in trauma. So that's why mindfulness is a wonderful antidote in practice. And we'll talk more about that for um, any students who may be holding trauma or adults. So we have the three areas, the prefrontal cortex, which is for our emotional regulation, our decision-making and our impulse control. A student who has experienced trauma, you may notice it's hard for them to focus, pay attention, or they may be paying attention to the wrong thing. They're constantly in this free state or this high alert, like something's gonna happen. The body keeps score. So the trauma is in the body, like, like anticipating the next event. And it cannot be, I wanna say cognitively, ration, um, cognitively rationalized. It's something that has to be discharged within the body. And again, not at a cognitive level. The next is the amygdala. The amygdala is a special part of the brain because it's that part of that old brain system that was meant to protect us, to alarm us of any threats or problems we may see. And the more stress that a person has, the larger or the more inflamed or the more active the amygdala is, which can actually lead to high feelings of anxiety, or being in danger. On the counter of that, practices which we did, breathing, mindfulness, yoga, has the ability to actually create a reduction in the size of the amygdala. So I wanna say stress inflames, mindfulness, yoga, practices of presence, gratitude, actually call it causes the structure to grow smaller. So it's really fascinating to find all this brain science that's happening now. And then we have the hippocampus. The hippocampus is right next to the amygdala. And when there is a threat, it's not time to retain or recall information. Again, we're going to that primordial fight or flight. We're not rational. We're not thinking, it's not time for learning. We either need to, you know, fight the threat or haul ass, let's say out of there. So under stress or trauma, the hippocampus can shrink because that's not necessary. That's not a primal need right now. So again, retention and recall is, is really difficult for students who have trauma. So it's actually just, it's fascinating to find out that, again, trauma is not just an event, trauma is in the body and directly impacts the brain. Okay, so next slide we have. Okay, so there is a roadmap to resiliency. So there's three things that educators can do. We have interoceptive awareness practices to be able to pay attention to ourselves. So I went over a little bit of the technical, the fight or flight. And, um, but to be able to recognize when our body is tight, when uh, we're not breathing, when the breath is shallow, to be able to notice when there's muscular tension or rapid heartbeat, or to even just know how they're feeling. If they're in a state of confusion or anger to be able to respond wisely instead of putting themselves in a situation where it might not be a good outcome. So we have the interoceptive awareness, which part of that is the five senses, hearing, seeing, smelling, touching, tasting, and they're all mindfulness practices I'll, I'll talk about a little bit further. Then we have balance, what, where's my body in, in space to be able to understand that. And also the proprioception, when we think about, okay, my arm is resting on 
an armchair. My feet are on the floor. So the practice that we did earlier, we're tuning into our proprioception. And then we have kinesthetic awareness. Kinesthetic is aware, awareness is, okay, what is going on with my muscles? Am I holding my belly in? Am I clenching my jaw? Am I gripping my hands? So when we can be aware of our senses, because we have these old animal nervous systems. So to recognize if the system is stuck in this high arousal state of tension, that with our awareness and the tools in our backpack, can we discharge any of that tension and come back into the parasympathetic? get the brain back on the learning. So then we have self-regulation, which is breathing and yoga that people can do on their own. And, and there's other things going for walks in nature, listening to music. And then we have co-regulation is having a stable adult nervous system in the, in the room. There's something in the body called mirror neurons, meaning that children's nervous system will respond to a healthy, balanced, parasympathetic adult nervous system. This is why mindfulness practices are also really important and self-regulation practices are really important for teachers to practice themselves. Because number one, we're in a ton of stress. Number two, your students are gonna be, are gonna try to regulate to you. And when we're calm, right? They'll become, those are the mirror neurons in the body. So if we're agitated and tight, we're not going to be able to neutralize, neutralize a situation. We have to neutralize ourselves first. So, all right. Um, next slide. So everyone, we remember, I love this. Everyone remembers his or own, who, who remembers his own education remembers the teachers, not the methods and techniques. The teacher is the heart of the system. And when I mean the teacher, I mean your body and your mind and your heart and your nervous system. Just, it's like the same quote. And they say, people will always remember how you made them feel. And, and, it, and, it, and it's the truth of the matter of that, especially our students. They're not gonna be like, oh, I'm impressed with that. They're gonna care about how you feel. And so with the education system, there is, I want to talk a little bit about the toxic stress. So with the toxic stress, I'm saying it's stressful. We're energy workers and the demands are getting bigger from scheduling to planning to the environmental and all that good stuff. And then if we move to educators and stress, you know, there is a burnout rate. So when I talk about the mirror neurons and about how we're supporting our students, it's important to support yourself as teachers, for administrators to support educators. So the self-care, you know, paradigm that's really big right now. I don't know how it is in New York on Long Island. There's a lot of self-care conferences, but I don't think anyone knows how integral it is to also the health and the balance of our students, especially as an informed trauma teacher, meaning that when we feel our best, we're able to be a resource for students and um, yeah, our presence and our hearts will be more open and we'll have more awareness to see what the, the needs will be, okay. And then for students, so if you click on the next slide and then the next one. So for students, what does stress do? So going back a little bit to the trauma model. So I like to say trauma is, and this is my own words in the way that I digested my material and my understanding. I feel trauma is, is excessive stress because the body's reaction to stress and trauma is the same. It's just two different words because 
Trauma can also be an isolated incident, but basically the nervous system responds the same. And for students, if you hit the next slide, Julia, <clears throat> The stress, again, we went over the brain model, it impairs attention, emotions, all that good stuff. Um, and it's an ep epidemic in the United States. And mindfulness is one of the solutions. If you come to the next side, and I'm gonna go back to this fight or flight, but just for every day. So we have a perceived threat. So I'm gonna use a high school student, a perceived threat. A teacher comes in, says, walks into the classroom and is like, okay, put your stuff away. There's gonna be a test today. And the student who was not prepared or forgot or didn't check their agenda, what do you think their reaction is? Oh no. And the body cannot, does not, does not perceive the difference between a saber tooth tiger, I wanna say, or a test. Heart starts beating faster. The stress hormones of cortisol and adrenaline are released. The body prepares for, for fight or flight. And let me tell you, explain why. So with iPhones, I think we might've had about 20 updates, 20 different iPhones. What are we, iPhone 11? So we have all these different upgrades within the iPhones. Within our bodies, we have had no upgrades within our nervous system. The only upgrade we developed this neocortex in order to think, to be creative, um, to plan, to analyze, to, whoops, did I lose you? Okay, here we go. This prefrontal cortex we have we or the neocortex, this higher order thinking, that's the only thing that we updated, but we still have this mammalian part of us that if we feel threatened, our body responds the same as if it was an English test or if it was a saber tooth tiger. So it's pretty scary because the body is releasing all of these hormones again, increased heart rate, pupils dilate, all the blood go to the hand or, and the feet. The body either has to, again, fight or get out of there. So go to, going to the next slide. <clears throat> so long-term stress, especially chronic acute stress when there are no coping, whoops, whoops, my on. Since when there are no coping skills, um, can really wear down a person's health, um, vitality, and confidence. And when I say vitality, I mean that's the life force. There's a vitality in this nervous system. The nervous system is like a slinky, meaning it has this built in resiliency. We're made to have stressful interactions, but not in a chronic way. And if you think about 200,000 years ago, if there was a saber tooth tiger, sorry, the announcements, if there was a saber tooth tiger and we had to either fight the tiger or flee, afterwards we'd probably go sleep in a cave for a day or two and recover. But here on an everyday basis, there's no recovery. You have that fight or flight or that stress response. And then there's no recovery. And then what happens? The body becomes ill, breaks down. There's, there's a societal exhaustion. So being able to have that interoceptive awareness to see like, hey, how am I feeling? Wait, my heart is beating. Wait, my stomach just dropped. There's butterflies because of all the blood went to the hands and the feet we can support ourselves. We can start recognizing, which is really important to bring us back into the parasympathetic. And for school children, it's important not only for their health, but also for learning. Because when the body is in 
the, stre- the, the fight or flight and the stress hormones come out, one of the first things that go offline is the prefrontal cortex. And like we learned also that um, the, the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus, which is responsible for that higher order thinking and that memory and recall, because that's not important right now. The importance is fighting for our life. Okay, so next slide. And here's that brain model again, and next slide. And again, I love this, the neuroscientists call it a cognitive dysfunction and it inhibits all the storing information, paying attention, planning, order skills, emotional regulation. So when I was talking earlier about that appropriate perception and the body awareness where of things are, you ever notice, and this is a good way to inform you as a teacher, especially if you're in elementary school, sometimes disorganization, or most of the time, or clumsiness um, can be a sign of, you know, toxic stress or even trauma, hold the body holding trauma, because there is, there's no way that we know. There are no tests right now to tell. There are no programs, no inventories, except the ACEs, like I, I spoke about earlier, to know what children may be holding in their body. And not only trauma that they may hold from this lifetime, studies are now seeing in the field of epigenetics that we actually have generational trauma and stress that can be passed on from generation to generation. So this stress is universal, right? I love this, you can't stop the waves, but you can learn to surf. Julia, you can keep on going. So the stress also inhibits our perception. I talked a little bit with the focus. I'm not gonna do this, we're not gonna have time. Let's move on. So again, the practice of paying attention to something grounding in the present moment. Again, stress and trauma. We want to focus on the wrong thing because we're feeling threatening. So grounding techniques, using the body, using the senses, we'll do some more, is a really important thing to do to tune attention. You know, as teachers or educators, or, or even if you're even if you're talking with a client or whoever you may be, giving a moment to allow whoever you may be interacting with to land, to focus, to feel, to know where they are, instead of going right here, come to the body first. Okay, we're going to continue. Um, and I love this quote. And mindfulness is a way that we Yes, you can have access to this PowerPoint, absolutely. So mindfulness can help you see more clearly. Clearly, So the mindfulness practice develops this interoceptive awareness. It's the formal practice, it's the exercise. How do we get this interoceptive awareness to see when we're in fight or flight or to notice are we in our heads or are we in our bodies in the moment? So mindfulness is one of the practices that help us to respond wisely. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide. And the, the basic definitions I have, paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. That's the biggest part of the whole entire definition. You can't leave out the non-judgmental, right? We were spoken, who, um, the lovely person who made a comment about the language I used of inviting students. It's that non-judgmental part, right? Notice it in inviting yourself to relax. So it's not like not saying relaxing, because if we say relax and you can't relax, then the next thing you know, the kid will start being like, oh, I can't relax. What's wrong with me? Why am I not doing right? And we start judging. So again, there's qualities to inviting students into the mindfulness practice. Um, so interoception awareness, it is our sixth sense. And many times as adults, we don't even take the time to check in with ourselves, you know? And just awareness itself is a, is a self-regulation. It's really interesting a lot of times when you sit and 
when I do these programs and I say, notice if your shoulders can fall away a little bit more toward the earth. See if it's possible to relax your belly. Notice if you're breathing. Notice if your jaw is clenched. Again, these simple, tiny nuances within the body can really change and bring the system back into the parasympathetic. So this is the skills for elementary school. Simon says is a great skill to have for interoception awareness, you know, um, but a curiosity and making it fun and normal. We don't talk about this enough. No one talks about, you know, are you sucking your belly and can you relax your belly? Notice your heart. Can you put your hand on your heart? Do you know that you have the most sensory neurons in your fingertips, in your hands, and when you put them to your heart, it actually can soothe the system in less than a minute. So there's a reason why when we see people who put their hands on their heart to calm down or when they feel overwhelmed, what's the meaning behind that? I think that's just really cool. So all these little tools to have in their toolbox and to have in your toolbox as well. So your body is always present. The present moment is the most honest, meaning that if we, when we're in our, in our minds or attentions in thinking, and usually we're thinking about what's going to happen in the future or what was wrong in the past to go back. And there's two places, what causes anxiety and stress and worry. And in the future, when our, when our thoughts are in the future, most times, nine out of 10 times, we're thinking what needs to be fixed? What do we need to prepare for in order to be safe and to protect us? That's the amygdala working. But our body is a place to always be like, what's happening now? Especially on days when there's overwhelm in the system, come back, Where? what's happening now? How can I regulate my system? Because when we take care of the present moment, the next moment takes care of, our, of itself. And if your brain is not online, that higher order thinking and that problem solving and the creativity is not gonna appear. So the body is always um, an important part of who we are. Okay, so let's try it. So let's do a little bit of a weather report. I love this. I do this with my students every time they come in and it also validates their feelings and why they're feeling. And, and it's not about normalizing being happy all the time. When there's also a share, it's wonderful because a lot of, I wanna say the support comes to know like, oh, other people feel that way too. So let's just pause. We're gonna, we'll pause for a minute and keep your eyes open or closed, whatever is most comfortable for you. And then notice, whoops, notice how you feel. And there might be one emotion. There could be more than one. I say sometimes a fusion. And I love this. How do you know that you know how you feel? What's informing you in your body? that you feel a particular way? What's informing you? Okay. So I have on the next slide, I'm missing some of my words there. That's so weird. Hold on, hold my other words. Give me one second, I wanna, my slide didn't finish. Okay. All right, so here's just some of the words, shaky, tingly, warm, calm, fuzzy, hot, chilled, 
jumpy, sweaty, strong, spacious. I'm going to add some more. Um, I, I have them. I don't know why it's not on this PowerPoint, but I will fix it and I'll resend, Julia, so you can send out the PowerPoint and yes, you can have it. So being able to understand your body, your muscles, your breath, your gut, your heart, your head. So it could be like, how's the breath today? This is what I do with the kids. So I'll sit down with you. So just bring your awareness to your breath. Very casual. The eyes don't have to be closed all the time to do this. It could be a casual conversation. See if you can just observe your breath and the pathway of your breath. Is it fast? Is it slow? Is it choppy? Is it smooth? Is the pathway really wide or narrow? Is it long? Does your breath go down to your belly or is your breath up at your neck? Can you feel your breath moving to other parts of your body? Is there a temperature to your breath? Is there a speed to your breath? Is there any rhythms or patterns to your breath? And all of this language can be done not just with the breath, you can, you can even to the heart, to the gut, to the mind, to the full body. But to have this interoception awareness is everything. Okay, so the next slide, and we only have a few minutes. So I'm gonna go a little, go through this PowerPoint a little, um, a little quicker than normal. So the breath, and I talked about how the breath impacts the system. So in the slide before I left, it's Dr. Richard, I want, yeah, on the slide before, I want to say Dr. Richard Miller, and I'm getting my slides going. Um, he, I have the YouTube link below. He is a Columbia University doctor, professor, and cre created coherent breathing. And different, I was talking about the, the different, the holding and the counts. You may, anybody who practices yoga and pranayama, Sometimes there are different breath counts to get different activations within the system. Sometimes you need to bring energy into the system. Sometimes energy needs to be discharged out. So um, coherent breathing is a great way to go to um, rest and digest. The YouTube video is there. There's four other videos that you'll be able to um, access that are wonderful. My high school students love it. They're about five, 10 minutes each. So you'll, you'll be able to have that. Um, next slide. Okay. So the, yeah, so for the next slide, so the, the impact of the breath. So to know, like, and, and the kids get so empowered to know, like, hey, listen, how many of you are taking driver's ed? Your breath is the gear shift and to the nervous system. And if you think the nervous system, I always say that's what makes you nervous or an anxious. Here's the tools in order to support yourself. Okay, so again, I'm moving down into the mindfulness. It's the development of attention awareness. There's a wonderful mindfulness is a superpower. <clears throat> um, 30 years of setting. I don't know where we are. Okay, there we are. I'm on my PowerPoint and the phone. So I am so sorry if I seem discombobulated. Okay, next slide. Okay, a little bit about more mindfulness. This is a basic stuff. You can keep going, Julia. The benefits of mindfulness practice. You can read that mindfulness in in education. And again, because it's bringing that prefrontal cortex back online, it's cooling down that amygdala in order to respond wisely, increase awareness and, and again, reducing stress. 
And here's our elements of emotional well being. Okay. And next slide and begin with yourself. Really important. Guys, the most important thing to regulate your classroom is regulate yourself. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. Having a mindfulness practice, um, a yoga practice, any sort of self-care practice. The one problem I want to talk about, just regular exercise, I have people who say, oh, I run. I'm like, the problem with running and even weightlifting is that you are actually in the sympathetic arousal when you are engaged in high energy activities. So we're trying to get into the parasympathetic. So there is mindful weightlifting and mindful exercise, which does, you know, release good drugs, but that you're still releasing adrenaline that's keeping us in the, in the sympathetic. So the self-soothing, calming, um, parasympathetic practices are important. So, okay. So I'm just going to end there. I have resources for you in case I have any questions. There's videos you can all access. I feel, usually you feel disconnected with Zoom. I feel a little bit more disconnected. So I so apologize if I seemed a little distant or scattered that was just that was in the room with me today so i thank everybody for their um attention and awareness if you have any questions um you can contact me anytime i i love being a resource and and i'll also be doing a day-long retreat for teachers on long island i don't know if there's anybody here from long island at um, an art museum in January, you can email. So I'm thank you everyone for the wonderful comments and your patience. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah, and thank you for your you you know your patience and your tenacity in some ways to you know we are not giving up. We're gonna come here. And I think you know you really shared a lot of really great information with us and you know, from this morning's keynote, it really fits so well, I think, you know, just to kind of flesh out what a regulated nervous system looks like and, and some practices that can be applied in the classroom and so forth. This is really wonderful. So um, to everyone, thank you also for hanging in there with us. I am putting uh, for the second time a um, um, survey about the program. Uh, we would love to have your feedback. You will all receive the recording of this um, in the next couple of days, along with the slides and um, all those great links that are in there, as well as with um, the recordings of all the other sessions that took place as well. If, if you are looking to get CTLEs, um, please use the link that was emailed to you. Um, and just to make sure um, that you have that, and otherwise, I would say let's open the floor for just a few more moments to see if anyone has questions for Deborah. Okay. So yes, and then I assume that your um, contact information will be on the slideshow as well if folks want to get in touch. Um, we really appreciate it. Remember to come back tomorrow uh, for our keynote presentation. This is promising to be a fantastic conversation from many different angles around youth mental health, wellness, and growth after 2020. Um, we look forward to having you there and Thank you for coming. We're just going to hang out here like we would be hanging out, you know, near the podium. And, you know, if anyone wants to come up and say a little hello, please do that. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And Deborah, thank you again. You're so welcome. Thank you, everybody. Everyone was wonderful.